I found Jesus seven years ago, but until that Sunday morning, I didn't know what to do with him. It wasn't for lack of asking, nor was I above whining. I'd even taken to begging. That day, in my usual third row from the back pew in Flagler Community Church, I started into what I called Allison Chamberlain's pathetic pleading prayer. Come on, I get it already, but what am I supposed to be doing about it? I had the usual undeniable sense that God was listening, probably leaning over to Jesus and saying, There she goes with the badgering, son. What I couldn't sense was his adding, What do you say we throw her a bone? I'd have taken anything and run with it. I recrossed my legs and tugged my uniform jacket over my hips and noticed that it didn't quite shimmy down like it used to. Too much time spent sitting in a carriage waiting for a fare. I folded my hands, angelically prayer-like, in my lap and refixed my gaze on the Reverend J. Garrett Howard, who was holding forth from the center aisle. This was his first Sunday not preaching from the cantilevered pulpit that hovered above us, like care flight from heaven. He said at the beginning of the service that he wanted to be closer to us as he brought forth the word. Very avant-garde, the Reverend Howard. What do you do when you're stricken by the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, he said now, also very literary. You take it to the foot of the cross. Joshy Michelinie's towhead bobbed into my line of vision, blocking out Reverend Gary and giving me full view of his seven-year-old self. He appeared to be doing a 360-degree survey of the congregation, finger inserted into left nostril. Was he looking for the foot of the cross? For a second, I thought he was about to raise his hand and ask for coordinates. The seven-year-old in me wanted to ask the same thing. I followed his gaze until his mother put her hand on top of his head and twisted it forward like she was turning a jar lid. Once again, I tried to focus on the Reverend Gary, but my glance snagged on Frank Parker, a fellow small group member who wore a puckered expression. Was he looking for the cross, too? Or was that just acid reflux? Probably not the latter. Frank was far too much the southern gentleman for indigestion. I felt a little queasy myself, though. What was wrong with me? I adjusted my jacket yet again and telescoped my gaze toward the sermon, except that across the aisle, Mary Alice Moss said, Amen, and I had to look at my watch. Bless Mary Alice's heart. If she was true to form, we'd be hearing another one of those about... Amen. Now, 32 seconds on the nose. Gary must be into his third point at this juncture. Another 32 and... Amen. My wonderful, multi-chinned Mary Alice must know exactly how to get to the foot of the cross. Or was it that the Reverend Garrett Howard was really that precisely inspiring? then why wasn't I inspired right now? I mean, I always checked out India Moorhead's outfit when she slipped into her pew, because the woman could definitely put one together. I always watched Frank execute his ushering duties as if every service were a formal wedding. I always caught Bonner Bailey checking me out over the top of his hymnal. But until that day, none of it had kept me from at least catching a thread of the sermon. I needed those threads to hold me together— I was a veritable tapestry woven from seven years' worth of them. Okay, maybe not something so elegant as a tapestry. Burlap feed bag, maybe. Okay, what was going on with me? I snapped the jacket down so hard I felt the seam pop. And then I felt something else. A nudge, like someone had given me a healthy shove with a beefy elbow. It was palpable, even though nobody was sitting on either side of me. Let us pray, the Reverend Howard said. Heads bowed in unanimous reverence. I stared over the tops of ponytails and buzz cuts and tinted blue perms, waiting for someone to poke me again while all the other eyes were closed. Nothing moved but Gary Howard's mustached lips as he poured out his prayer. No one else spoke, except a clear voice in my head. Allison, it said. Go out and buy a Harley. I whipped my head around, sharply enough to pull Bonner Bailey's eyes up from his lap and cock his head at me. I was obviously acting as weirded out as I felt, 
and I was obviously the only one who had heard it, which meant it was probably my imagination. Or maybe I was the one with acid reflux.